Spanish. <laughs> so it's your choice, uh, whether you want English or Spanish. What do you think? English. 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 Okay, let's go. Let's go with English. I'm, uh, my name is Juan Carlos Hidalgo. I'm a policy analyst from Latin America at the Cato Institute. Uh, and uh, I'll be giving a, a presentation on economic freedom and progress. Why economic freedom is so important. And specifically, what economic freedom is. Is, you know, because there are so many conditions about what uh, economic freedom entails. And uh, then we're going to finish by uh, taking a look at America Latina, which are the freest economies, how they're doing, and some uh, free market reforms and euro reforms taking place around the world, they have taken place around the world and, uh, in Latin America. Let's start with this chart. This chart, I don't know if you've seen it before. The, the late uh, economist Angus Madison, who died a few years ago, uh, his, uh, he went on to calculate uh, the per capita income of humanity, the wealth of humanity since the year zero to the year 2000. And this is what he found. He found that uh, for most of uh, modern history, seems, well, there is no year zero. I was, uh, I was uh, told earlier today, which is true. From year one, Birth of Christ, let's say, to uh, the 1800s, more or less, the income, per capita income of humanity, because the humanity was basically stagnant. Uh, it was the equivalent of less than one dollar per day, which meant that most of humanity, almost all of humanity, lived in abject poverty, misery, throughout well, most of modern history. Uh, a very interesting uh, uh, fact that somebody told me, not a fact, but a, a, a thought experiment. Uh, somebody pointed out that what would have happened if uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, the author of the Declaration of Independence of the United States and one of the founding fathers of that country, what would have happened if Thomas Jefferson, who lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, had invited uh, Julius Caesar for dinner? You know, Julius Caesar, the emperor, he ruled Rome, like 50 years, 40 years before Christ. What would have happened if Julius Caesar had come to Monticello, where uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson had his house, and uh, they would have dinner? Well, Julius Caesar would have arrived in a horse star, like the ones that were common to Thomas Jefferson. I mean, Julius Caesar wouldn't have been impressed by, by uh, the technology and modernity of Monticello at that time. The meals would have been cooked pretty much the same, using the same utensils and the same equipment. Uh, they would probably have a dinner under the candlelight, just like it was Caesar in the 18th century. Which means, this, this story means that during all this period, humanity didn't experience any progress, any technological advancement, any, uh, any create, significant creation of wealth. But something happened here. Around the 1800s, late 1800s, when the income per capita of humanity skyrocketed and continues to increase. So the question before us is figuring out what happened exactly in this period and how we can continue this process as history moves forward. <coughs> this is war poverty throughout time. Again, in the, uh, 200 years ago, 200. Uh, uh, 85% of humanity lived in, in absolute poverty. And absolute poverty is uh, one equivalent of $1.25 per day. And that has been increasing ever since. And it has been accelerating, particularly in the last 70 years, 60 years. Interestingly enough, during this period, 1980, 2010, something extraordinary happened, something that won't happen again ever in the history of mankind. And it's that 680 million Chinese left poverty, were lifted out of poverty. Uh, then Xiaoping started these reforms in the late 1970s. Since then, China has been growing at a rate of 9.7% a year. And in this period, 680 million Chinese left poverty and went on to the middle class in China, which is something that has changed the course of history. So what is behind all this progress? What is behind this dramatic increase in wealth and this dramatic decline in poverty levels around the world? 
Some people claim that this is due to government activism. Governments have expanded, at least since after World War II. Now you have many programs, government programs, such as security, Voice of Familia, and so on. And it's because of these programs that uh, we have less people living in poverty, and we have welfare societies. But that's not, exact, that's not the case. Uh, three economists from the World Bank, uh, David Dollar, Tatiana Kleinberg, and Mark Gray, recently published this paper uh, for the World Bank in August last year. And they found that around 80% of the improvement in income for the poor is 40% in 118 countries was due to economic growth, not, not social programs, not redistributive programs. So this shows that it is economic growth what is causing what happened. Uh, so this shows that it is economic growth and not government activism, what is behind the uh, tremendous progress that we have witnessed uh, in, the last, uh, in the last years, in the last decades. Now the question is, what is behind economic growth? What are the causes of economic growth? And I'm going to uh, present to you the case for economic freedom. And what do we understand for economic freedom? We understand high degree of personal choice. That is that, that people, individuals, are the ones who uh, decide what economic activities to be involved in, what to sell, what to buy, what to invest, what to own, what to save, how much to save, etc. The decision-making process is individual, it's not collective. Uh, yes, there are voluntary exchanges coordinated by markets. People exchange with um, under no coercion whatsoever. If you buy something or you sell something, it's because you want to, voluntarily. And these exchanges are coordinated by markets. And by markets, I don't mean Gordon Gecko, you know, like in front of a computer in Wall Street. I mean, every single uh, exchange, every single uh, uh, engagement uh, where people buy and sell freely in any kind of setting. You know, it can be a flea market, it can be uh, Drug story can be anywhere. Whenever you have two people uh, exchanging goods or services, then you have a market. Then freedom to compete and enter markets. That means that you can do whatever you want to do uh, economically without other people in stopping you from doing it, from, from engaging in those kind of activities. If you want to sell ice cream in Greenland, well, you can do it. But uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to be, you're going to be successful or not. But at least you have the freedom to enter into economic activities, as long as you don't have the rights of others. And that's the four uh, criteria, protection of people and their properties from the aggression of others. Most, uh, a lot of uh, libertarians and classical liberals think that uh, this is the proper function of governments, to protect people from the aggression of others. Uh, other libertarians don't believe that there should be a government at all. But the thing is that there should be some sort of entity that protects people and their properties, and especially that that entity doesn't become the main aggressor of people. Which, uh, if we look at world history, governments tend to become that kind of uh, aggressor. Following this uh, criteria, uh, a group of economists led by Milton Friedman, the economic uh, uh, prize, Nobel Prize winner, uh, in the late 1970s, they began discussing uh, the, uh, the creation of an index to, in order to measure the economic policies of the countries and see how uh, complementary to the concepts of economic freedom they were. And uh, they came across, they came, they came up with this uh, economic freedom index, economic freedom of the world report, which is published annually by the Fraser Institute in Canada and co-published uh, by many dozens of, of, uh, of other think tanks around the world, including Instituto Libertad here in, in Brazil, and the Cato Institute in the United States. And uh, Milton Friedman wanted to prove that these ideas that had been discussed literally for centuries, for a couple of centuries, about economic theory, they were, he wanted to prove, to measure and prove it objectively. And uh, after many 
meetings and, and discussions and so on, they cannot find uh, a way to measure economic liberty using five key components. <clears throat> First of all, size of government. Size of government, in size of government they uh, measure public spending as a, as, as, as a, as a share of, of the GDP, of, of the size of the economy. They measure taxation, uh, how high taxes are and at what level of income people are taxed. Uh, and they measure whether governments own enterprises. Uh, you know that in, in our countries, uh, governments are fond on owning enterprises. They own airlines, they own refineries. Uh, they used to own a lot of things back in the 70s, fertilizer companies, aluminum plants, etc., etc. It would be uh, interesting uh, to make a list of all the things that the government used to own back in the 70s and 60s here in Latin America. But when a government owns companies, well, the government is, is supposed to be the referee in, in the market. You know, when the government becomes a player, it distorts the market. It, it, it is unfair for, for all the companies. Why? Because government companies are ultimately backed by the taxpayer. If they fail, the taxpayer is the one paying the bill. And that's not fair. That's not fair competition. Also, they have easy access to credit because sometimes the government owns banks too. Like for example, here in Brazil, the bank is, is uh, how do you call it, banks? Tendes. Tendes is a leading uh, financial institution that gives a lot of money to favored companies. So it's not it's not fair when the government owns companies, and that's why it is also measured in size of government. Then you have legal system and property rights. Here you measure uh, different things. You measure, for example, judicial independence. You measure impartial courts, protection of property rights, military interference in the rule of law and politics, integrity of the legal system, legal enforcement of contracts. Regulatory restrictions on sale of real property, reliability of police, and business costs on crime. It is important to point out that, again, there is a, a, a very lively discussion within uh, libertarian circles of whether uh, you need a government to do this job or not. But to those people who believe in government, it's, it's important to point out that uh, a key component of economic freedom involves having a government that makes that imposes some rules, some basic rules, and protects private property. Then we have some money. Some money here basically you look at monetary policies. Uh, in our countries, in Latin America and around the world, it's been the case that uh, throughout history when governments run out of money, they go to the central bank and they ask the central bank to print money in order to finance themselves uh, that creates inflation. And in some cases, hyperinflation, as uh, you did here, as uh, you had here in Brazil in the early 1990s. Uh, so when we look at sound money, we look at inflation rate, we look at the variability, volatility of, of inflation rate, and we also look at whether governments uh, impede the access of people to foreign currencies, to, to bank accounts and foreign currencies. When you have a country with high inflation rate, uh, what people usually do is try to escape from, the, from, from that currency and try to own dollars or euros or, or whatever, you know? And it's pretty usual that governments try to block that. that they try to impose some limits on the amount of dollars and of foreign currency that people have. And we've seen it in Venezuela, we've seen it in, uh, in Argentina. So here in some money, uh, one of the criteria used to measure this Component is whether people have access to foreign currency, easy access to foreign currency. Then you look to freedom to trade internationally. Freedom to trade internationally, you look at tariffs, you know, like taxes on, on the import, on, the, on, the, on imported goods. Uh, we also look at non tariff regulations, and you know that uh, since uh, we have experienced some trade liberalization uh, through the WTO, through the World Trade Organization, and through uh, free trade agreements, governments are relying more heavily on non tariff barriers, on regulatory barriers to trade. And for example, the, the European Union has a regulation that uh, demands that the banana has to have certain shape 
the angle of a banana has to be a certain, you know, like degree, and if it doesn't comply to that, it's not a banana, then it cannot be imported into the EU. Stop, stupid things like that. The governments are increasingly more uh, engaging with these kind of uh, barriers to trade. So you may, you know, we have to measure also that in the to trade national. We also measure there uh, capital controls. Uh, whether people are free to move money freely from among nations. Uh, many countries impose capital controls, Brazil is one of them. Uh, recently with the, finan with, with the aftermath of the financial crisis, Brazil was one of the leading voices for imposing some capital controls in order to prevent people from bringing too much money to Brazil and then take it away. So uh, you look at that also. And then in the last couple of years, the, the index has also looked into business and barriers for people to move across borders. Because we Europeans not only believe that goods and services and money should move freely across borders, but also people. So if a country imposes too many visas and too many restrictions on the movement of people, that also hurts uh, economic freedom. And finally, we look at friendly market, labor market, and business regulations. Here we look at, at a vast array of regulations that impede economic activity. You look at uh, access to credit. You look at uh, how long it takes to start a business. You look at firing regulations, hiring regulations, minimum wages, licensing requirements, etc. As you can see, it is, the concept of economic freedom is quite complex. It cannot be limited just to taxation, or just to public spending, or just to signing free trade agreements with the United States. Many people think that Mexico is one of the freest economies in Latin America just because it has a free trade agreement with the United States. No, that's not just one criteria to, uh, that's not just all the, all the uh, that doesn't explain all the economic liberty. Uh, many people also point out in Latin America to Scandinavian countries. And they say that, well, how do you explain that Sweden has high taxes and a big government and is rich and prosperous? That definitely goes again everything that you talk about economic liberty. But the thing is that they're just looking at size of government. They're not looking at the other things. When you look at the ecosystem of property rights of the Scandinavian countries, they're among the best in the world. When you look at some monetary policies, they're among the best in the world. When you look at the freedom to trade international, they're one of the most open economies in the world. When you look at the regulations, they have pretty, pretty sensible regulations. The problem with the left in Latin America, when they look after the Scandinavian model, is that they just want the taxes and the spending of the Scandinavians. They don't want the rest. And actually, Scandinavian countries rank among the freest economies using this material in the world. So we have to be very careful when talking about economic liberty, because it's a very nuanced concept. It involves many uh, components, and you cannot just limit it to, to, to matters of free trade agreements or taxes or, no, you have to look at the entire uh, package. So let's look at the top 10 economic uh, freedom, the top, top 10 freest economies in, in, in the world. We have Hong Kong, which is uh, not a country, but it's an uh, autonomous uh, unit of, of China, or a region. It's been the freest economy since, since the ranking began being uh, published in the 1970s. Then you have Singapore, New Zealand, Sweden, uh, United Arab Emirates, Mauritius, Finland, Bahrain, Canada, and Australia. Do you notice a pattern in this top 10? Small. Yeah? Eight out of the ten are small countries, very small. Just Canada and Australia can be considered big countries. Uh, any other one? No. Ethnic patterns? Religious patterns? Demographic patterns? Uh, cultural background? No? no. We have here Chinese. We have here Anglo Saxon, we have Europeans, we have Arabs, we have Africans. Uh, Chile is number 11, so that would be a uh, Latino right there. So there is no predisposition, cultural predisposition, religious predisposition, or whatever, to economic freedom, to the policies, uh, to the institutions of economic freedom, as we can see in this top 10. Another observation about this top 10? Any missing? Huh? They are rich. No? Any easy country here? Yes. Yeah? The United States is not here. 
you know, the beacon of capitalism, you know, like uh, the, the evil empire. It's not here, it's number 17 in the ranking. And it's been falling since the year 2000, even before Obama came to power. George Bush came to power, and the United States started falling in the 80s. Now let's look at the bottom 10. Here you can see some sort of a geographical pattern, which is that seven of the ten countries here are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, Central African Republic, Angola, Chad, Zimbabwe, Republic of Congo. Uh, and this is where you find the most pervasive pockets of war poverty in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. You also have Algeria in Northern Africa, Myanmar, and Venezuela. Uh, you might wonder, where is Cuba? But yeah, that is actually my question. Where is Cuba and North Korea? Yeah, where is Cuba and North Korea? Exactly. Well, the deal is that this index is produced using data from uh, international organisms and credible sources, such as the IMF, uh, the World Bank, uh, the World Economic Forum, Transparency International, the uh, World Trade Organization, and so on. So with certain economies, you simply don't have credible data. You know, what's the uh, uh, public spending on North Korea? Who knows, you know? So certain countries are not included in this index because you don't have data. Uh, North Korea, Cuba, Laos, Sudan, Libya, and so on. Who do Russia? Russia is included. Uh, Russia is right next to Brazil. It's the 103rd economy. Brazil is 102. <laughs> so, as you can see, uh, certain countries are not included. We have 152. Now, for those that we have information, reliable information, Venezuela is the least free economy. And we'll see how, how sad of a story the one of Venezuela is later. This is economic freedom for time. As you can see, it has been increasing. Since the 1980s, uh, there was a minor hiccup in 2008 and 2009 due to the financial crisis. Many people were afraid that the mistakes that were uh, made after the Great Depression in the Western world uh, were going to be repeated uh, to the financial crisis. And so we certainly saw uh, an increase in the status policies. We saw that public spending went up. You know, all the stimulus packages, and many leaders around the world said that they were Keynesians again, and they increased spending significantly. Uh, we saw some nationalizations of companies. We saw, uh, we saw loose monetary policies, and we can still see some loose, loose monetary policies in the United States and, and Europe and, and now Japan. We saw uh, the imposition of trade barriers, mostly tariffs. And, and we saw also like the, the implementation of stiff regulations in certain sectors of the economy, like finance in particular. So yeah, economic freedom suffered a bit in the aftermath of the financial crisis, but it has increased again on average around the world, which means that hopefully that this, this trend will continue and we will look at this as, as a minor hiccup and not as a, as a, as a nominal trend there. This is economic freedom of the world, like the map, the red is the, these three economies, the ones in red is the ones that you didn't have information back then, and the light blue and blue are the three economies. As you can see, Latin America was extremely uh, status back in the 1975, with the exception of one country, Venezuela. Venezuela was the freest economy of South America back in 1975, and the least free economy of South America was Chile, of India. And this is how it has changed. Take a look at China and India. You know, you have to look at those two countries because 36% of the world population are in those countries. And this is where we are right now. The world has moved more decisively towards uh, economic freedom. It's, of course, some sanctions and mostly in South and Inner Africa because this is where uh, the least free economies and to be. Why is economic freedom so important? Economic freedom produces economic growth and prosperity. Uh, there are no examples 
around the world of a country that has significantly <coughs> reduced poverty without having economic growth. Economic growth is the key to progress. And there are no examples, or very few examples, of a country that has enjoyed long-lasting economic growth that didn't open up its economy. You have countries that have had a high economic growth for a decent period of time, like Brazil. Brazil did in the 1970s, 7% on average throughout the decade, by you know, like nationalizing industries and, and having barriers to trade and high public spending and inflation and so on. Yeah, and Brazil grew 7% for a decade, but then it crashed in the 1980s. So you can have examples of countries growing fast for a decent period of time, just doing the opposite. But they eventually crash. The only ones that grow continuously without crashing, but without experiencing serious setbacks, they are the ones who have economic theory. Economic rights are fundamental rights, meaning that without them, there can be no political or civil liberties. We will see that uh, later. And it is the prerequisite for broader human development. Let's look at economic freedom and economic growth. If you take the 152 economies divided, by four groupings, you can see that the three economies are the ones that have the highest living standards, significantly higher living standards than the others. Why? Because they are the economies that grow the fastest. The three economies grow faster than the other economies. And you might say, you might say, well, this is not significant. You know, like this is less than one percentage point of difference between the previous economies and the third uh, previous economies, the third, the third group. But you know that one percentage point throughout time is the difference between development and other development. If Mexico had grown one percentage point faster a year since 1870s to 1990s, it would be richer today than the United States. So one percentage point is the difference. Can be the difference between being a wealthy nation and being a third world country. The poorest people, the 10 poorest percent of the population, tend to have higher incomes in the three economies than in the least three economies, which show that economic liberty benefits all, even the, the, the people who have uh, less resources in societies. And as you can see, the three societies have almost eradicated poverty, absolute poverty. Whereas the least free societies, they, have, they still have a significant chunk of the population living under uh, misery. You know, like many people, I, I've shown those graphs before, and some people have pointed out that uh, correlation doesn't imply causation. And uh, you can show graphs that, you know, like you can have a graph showing that uh, societies will, with blonde people tend to have higher income per capita. So that doesn't mean that if you dye your hair blonde, then you're going to become rich. Well, but the, the topic of economic freedom is a topic that has been studied literally for centuries. Let's go back to 1759, when this gentleman, Adam Smith, an ethics professor in Scotland, published his first book. Uh, theory of moral sentiments. It's actually a, a book of philosophy and, 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 and um, a book of philosophy. Of philosophy. And uh, one of the interesting things that I'm asking is that he lived in that period, let's go back to the Agnes Madison chart, he lived in that period when societies began growing richer, you know. He was one of the first people to notice this uh, until then very new phenomenon. And he started wondering and writing about about that. Let's remember that back then, there was no economics. Uh, actually, Adam Smith is, is, is said to be uh, the father of economics. So, Adam Smith, in his first book, he wrote the following. Legal ends is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest corporations, but peace, easy taxes, and a troubled administration of justice. All the rest being brought about by the natural force of events. Here, Adam Smith in 1759 was describing the basic tenets of economic freedom. Low taxes, easy taxes, a total administration of justice, that is rule of law, and peace, 
you know, you will have aggression, a constant aggression from third parties to your properties or your or, or your self. And he will dwell on these topics in his later book, The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1776, where he added some other components to uh, this mix of economic freedom. He added free trade, and he wrote a lot about free trade in, in that book. So, as you can see, that is people describing economic freedom back in the in the 18th century. And since then, since then, literally dozens of studies and books have been written about the linkage between economic freedom and growth. So uh, there is little argument that economic freedom is a cause of prosperity in that regard. Let's look at economic freedom and human development. If you take the U.S. Human Development Index, which is an index that the United Nations publishes annually, that not only takes into account per capita income, but also takes into account uh, life expectancy, takes into account access to healthcare, access to education, and, and, and other measures of, of, of well-being, you can see, again, that the freest economies have a higher human development performance than the least free economies. Life expectancy is almost 20 years higher in the freest economies than in the least free economies. Infant mortality is almost 10 times lower in the freest economies than in the least free economies. And you know, if you look at this data, and you take it into a concrete example, huge one, uh, like India, you will see the human impact of economic freedom. You know that India, when it became independent out here in the late 1940s from Britain, it adopted an extremely close economic model. It wasn't a Soviet economy, per se, but it was one of the closest economies in the world. Uh, it, it opted for uh, self-sufficiency, high trade barriers, uh, no foreign investment, ownership of, of big industries, just the government ownership of big industries, strict regulation of economic activity, and so on. And India grew very slowly for three decades after independence. On average, 3.5% a year since the late 1940s until the 1980s. In 1981, India began opening up its economy. It implemented some liberalization measures, over some trade barriers, allowed a little foreign uh, direct investment, and so on. And India began growing 5% a year in the 1980s. And then in 1991, Manmohan Singh, who, I don't know if he's still the Prime Minister of India, or at least until yesterday was the Prime Minister of India, he was the Finance Minister of India in 1991, and he adopted a more aggressive liberalization process. He, uh, they privatized uh, industries, they opened up to foreign trade, they opened up to foreign direct investment, uh, they dismantled the, what it's, it was called the license rush, you know, like all these controls on, on uh, private entrepreneurship and so on. And India began growing at 7%, and during the 2000s, even grew at 8%, 9% at some point. So, my colleague from India, we have a colleague that came from India, uh, Swami, also Nana and Kaisal, uh, Swami uh, went on to calculate the following. What would have happened to social indicators, to leading social indicators in India, in the reforms that were implemented in 1981 had taken place in 1971, 10, 10 years later, a decade later? What would have been the impact on infant mortality? What would have been the impact on uh, literacy? What would have been the impact on poverty? In that growth rate, that India experienced in the 1980s, you know, 5%, had taken place in the 1970s, instead of the 3.5%. Well, look at what he found. 14.5 million children would have survived due to a lower mortality rate in India. I don't want to belittle the Holocaust, because the Holocaust was a terrible human tragedy, tragedy but this is 2.5 times the number of, of children that were killed by Hitler uh, in the Holocaust. Just to put it into context, a staggering figure of the number of children that died because of, of a high mortality rate in, in, in India. 261 million Indians who 
have become richer. And 109 million Indian will have state poverty. Just by implementing TV reforms, because they were TV, TV reforms 10 days later. Of course, India is a huge country, the second most populous country in the world, so we can see the impact of the labor reform in, 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 in this context. But uh, this is, a, a, I think, is a, a very telling example of why this is a matter of life or death, literally, implementation or not of, of, of free market policy. The name of the study is Socialism Kills, and I think it's a pretty uh, good title for, for this work. Environmental freedom and, and, and economic freedom and environmental performance. You know that, <clears throat> I think that if we look at the, the state of the debate in Latin America nowadays, we will see that the left has conceded the argument on growth, even on prosperity. They already know and they admit that economic freedom is the way to go when it comes to growth rates and, and, and prosperity. But they're now like trying to change the subject, and they're trying now to bring out other topics to the discussion. One of them is environmental matter, and the other one is income distribution, inequality. Now, let's look at the environmental performance first. Uh, Columbia University and Yellow University, they released in 2008 an environmental performance index. And if you compare the previous economies to the least free economies, you see that the previous economies have higher environmental uh, performance than, uh, than the least free economies. And this should be a surprise. This is what is called the environmental goodness curve. Uh, the environmental goodness curve tells the following story. As countries grow richer, the environment begins to suffer. There is environmental degradation as the per capita grows. Why? Because people are more interested in those early stages of development to satisfy their most immediate needs, be it food, be it shelter, be it COVID. They don't care about anything else. They don't care about animals, they don't care about forests, they don't care about anything else. But once a society reaches certain income per capita, certain point, certain level of wealth, we begin seeing and Kustis did this by, by observation, we begin seeing that the environment, environment starts to improve. Why? Because once people have satisfied their most immediate needs, they worry about other things. They worry about education, healthcare, nature, going to politics, and then they start eventually worrying about animal welfare, about the environment. They don't want to live in a polluted uh, city. They don't want to have uh, dirty water. Uh, they don't want to have uh, dirty air. And then they start demanding environmental quality. And we see then that the environment starts improving. According to goodness, this point is around $8,600 per capita. So when a country reaches $8,600 per capita, is when we begin seeing this process. And this is exactly the point where China is right now. If you read about China, you read a lot of stories about pollution. And you will see that. The, the main topic for what the Chinese protest every day, because there are hundreds of protests across China every day, is because of pollution. It's not about the right to tweet or, or access to Facebook or anything. It's pollution. They're tired of the, their cities being filthy, they're tired of, of, of polluted air, they're tired of polluted rivers, and so on. And they're demanding that the government does something to clean the country, to have a, 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 a better environment. So the key to prosperity is increasing this process when a country is making it as fast as possible, the process where countries reach a descent of, of, of income per capita where people start demanding a better environment. And we can see it throughout history. This is England in the 19, in the 1880s. If you read Charles Dickens, and you know the author of A Christmas Story, uh, you read the, the portraits of, of Charles Dickens of Victorian England, you see a very filthy place. You know, people who die uh, young with, with uh, pulmonary diseases because of the, of the dirty air and the coal uh, that was being burned to, to, to fire factories and all this stuff, the power factories. And now we see that in China. This is a picture of China in, in, in recent times. And you can see the similarities. 
But you now go to England, and you don't see this anymore. You see a very clean place. The Thames, the, the river, is as clean as it's been in 200 years. And uh, why? Because it's a country that grew prosperous, and uh, prosperity came along with a cleaner environment. And we will eventually see this in China, where the country continues to grow rich as fast as it has been in the last three decades. Let's look at economic freedom, democracy, and political freedoms. If you take the Freedom Hub in the World Report, which is uh, produced by Freedom House, I think that, and they look at civil liberties and political freedoms, and you compare it to the Economic Freedom Index, you again see a correlation between economic liberty and political and civil rights. Here, the closest to the closest one, the better. Milton Friedman used to say that uh, economic freedom was a prerequisite for, uh, political, uh, for political freedom. And we have seen certainly in the past 30 years or, or 40 years across the world that every time a military dictatorship has liberalized the economy of its country, that military dictatorship ends up falling. We saw it in Chile, we saw it in South Korea, we saw it in Taiwan. We will eventually see it in China. It's that, that's the great conundrum of the, of the Chinese leadership that they want their, their country to keep growing at 9% a year, hopefully, for the foreseeable future, and the society to grow wealthier, but they know that sooner or later, that large middle class that is building up in China is going to demand political freedoms. That's happening everywhere in the world. And, we will, and that's why the Cuban leadership, the Castro brothers, don't want meaningful economic reform. And you look about reforms in Cuba, and they're not all. You know, like uh, five years ago or something like that, that they legalized 286 professions in Cuba. Now you can be a clown without being a government employee. Uh, you can, you know, like uh, repair shoes without being a government employee. But those are the kind of reforms that they are implementing in Cuba. You know, you can have a restaurant in your house, but you cannot have more than 10 tables in that restaurant. Uh, and if your restaurant is successful, they come and shut you down, as it happened two years ago in one of the most popular restaurants in, in, in Havana. Why? Because they don't want people to get rich. Because they know that prosperity comes along with, uh, with uh, uh, growing demands for political and civil liberties. Now, well, we can see it in the region. Chile, 1975, a very brutal dictatorship. Actually, Chile was the last South American country to get rid of, of, of this dictatorship. It now has the strongest democratic institutions according to the World Justice Project. It's the freest economy in Latin America, one of the freest in the world. Venezuela was the only South American democracy in 1975. It was the freest economy of South America in 1975. This is uh, uh, Robulo Betancourt, the former Venezuelan president Boeing. And now Venezuela is the least economy free, uh, free economy in, in South America, in the world. And it's a democracy in name only. Corruption. Corruption is a hot topic here in Brazil and around Latin America. If you take the Transparency International Index, the Corruption Perception Index, uh, produced by Transparency International, this journal think tank, and you compare it to the economic freedom index, you will get see that the freest economies are the most transparent. Here are the closest to it, the better. And it shouldn't surprise you, uh, this, this correlation. What do you think of politicians? What is your concept of politicians? That are kids, so you can feel free to voice your grievances. Well, you, you think that politicians are corrupt, they're liars, they're, they're opportunistic, uh, you know, like uh, those are the things that can be said in politics. So what do you think will happen if you give more power to politicians or the economy? Do you think you will have a least corrupt country, less corrupt country, or more corrupt country? You will have a more corrupt country, you know? If you want to start a business, but in order to start a business, you need to engage and go through 14 bureaucratic procedures instead of one. Do you think in which scenario do you think there's more likelihood of corruption? In the one in 14 bureaucratic procedures. Because sooner or later, in those 14 different procedures, somebody's going to demand a right. Or if you want to import something, and uh, in one scenario, you have to spend six months waiting for that product to come out of customs. Or in the other one, if you don't need to go to Boston because there are no tariffs to that problem. In which scenario do you think it's more likely that there's going to be corruption? 
or if you have lots of public enterprises and political appointees in all these public enterprises, or you have private companies, in which scenario do you think it's gonna, there's going to be more chances of public corruption? In the lab, in the free reform. So it's not a surprise, and this is something that the left hates. I think that the left hates this graph, and I, I tried it in Costa Rica, and they almost foam, you know, like broke home through the mouth. Because corruption is one of the factors, the fight against corruption. But when you can show them that the bigger the border, the least free the economy, the more corruption, they go nuts because they don't like it. They, they, they know for a fact that the free societies tend to be the most transparent. And look at again to Chile and Venezuela. Chile is the second most transparent country in, uh, in the Americas. Venezuela is the least transparent country in the Americas. Let's look at the state of economic freedom in Latin America. This is the average of the 10 most free economies. This is the Latin American average. Yes, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there will be some reforms, but ever since, economic freedom has been pretty much stagnant, on average, in the region. But there have been some uh, individual cases of success. Let's look again at, at Chile, the least free economy of Latin America in 1975. Now it's number 11 in the world. 50% of Chileans lived in absolute poverty in 1950, in the 1975. Now it's 11 percent. Chile has an income per capita of $19,000, uh, which is the highest in the region. And according to the, the estimates of the, the uh, IMF, by 2018 it's going to reach $24,000 per capita income, which will qualify as a, as a developed nation, the first developed nation of Latin America. Uh, Chile has the strongest institutions, democratic institutions in Latin America. It has the second least corrupt, it's the second least corrupt country. So now, again, we're seeing in Chile an example of how economic freedom, all the other concepts that I've told you about economic freedom, uh, come into play in, a, in an example in Latin America. Then you have Peru. Peru was a mess in the late 1980s when Ana Garcia left the country almost bankrupt with hyperinflation, two episodes of hyperinflation in the 1980s. And then in the 90s, uh, Peru began reforming. They began implementing reform, privatizing industries, lowering tariffs, dismantling regulations, and so on. And Peru has grown on average 7% a year since 1995 to the present. It's the fastest growing South American economy. Poverty was 54% in 2000. It's now 24% in 2013. So once again, Peru is showing that these ideas were given in an extremely troubled country, as Peru was in 1990. Let's look at some other examples. Argentina. Argentina engaged in a serious liberalization process in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. But Argentina is an example of what I mentioned before about the five components of economic freedom. Why you cannot judge a country only by uh, one set of policies uh, only, you know? Uh, Argentina did many good things in the late 1980s and 1990s. It opened up its economy to the world. It lowered tariffs significantly. It privatized industries. It adopted a currency war, which meant that they could no longer print pesos freely. The central bank could print pesos freely, but was tied to the dollar. And uh, that got rid of hyperinflation. They had hyperinflation, and they went from having hyperinflation to no inflation in just a matter of a year. So Argentina did a lot of things correctly, and you can see that in the, in the economic freedom index. But they never controlled one aspect of their economy. Public spending. Public spending kept growing up significantly during the 1990s. With the caveat that before the, the politicians will finance themselves with inflation, you know, they will go to the central bank and print money. But they couldn't do that anymore in the 1990s because they had the currency war. So what did they do? Debt. They went to uh, foreign markets, got a lot of debt, and eventually those foreign markets, those uh, Creditors lost confidence in the Chile and the Argentinian economy, and they stopped borrowing money. They started not borrowing money 
to Argentina, and Argentina is going to be winning to the ball, the largest of all in history. And uh, since then, the nation took over, and we've seen Argentina fall every single year in the economic trade units. You have Venezuela, the freest economy of South America. In uh, 1975, the wealthiest country of South America in 1975. But in these years, is when Carlos Andres Perez made a painful decision. He was nationalizing oil. And uh, given the oil high prices, prices of the late 1970s, uh, the political class in Venezuela grew used to having a lot of wealth distributed and had given handouts and so on. They were more concerned about distributing wealth than creating it. And the economic freedoms began suffering since then. Of course, oil prices collapsed. And the, the, the uh, Venezuelan economy went into trouble. They did some reforms in the 1990s trying to rescue the boat. Coincidentally, it was Carlos Andres Pérez, the one that did that. But it was too late. In 1999, even the popular discontent and the corruption of the political class, Hugo Chavez is elected president, and since then, the economy and economic freedom in that country has gone downhill. But as you can see, this is a process that didn't begin with Hugo Chavez. It was already well underway since the late 1970s. And here is Brazil. Brazil, you implemented reforms in the 1990s, the Plan of Real, you opened up the economy to lower trade barriers, privatized industries. Even during the rural years, you had some reforms. You simplified the tax code a little bit. You know, you used to have 44 uh, tax rates, and now you have five. Uh, but still, it's not enough. I mean, you're basically catching up with the American average, which is pretty low. Uh, you, are, uh, you are 102 among 152 economies. You have a lot of potential and a lot of catching up. One can only wonder what will happen to Brazil if you guys, uh, you know, like start engaging in serious reforms. Let's talk about inequality because inequality is the other uh, banner of the left in Latin America, and I think that is a banner we should run away from. We should engage them in this debate because we have a lot to say by we I mean classical liberals or libertarians. This is a report published last year by the uh, internet by the International Labour Organization and it found that 47.7 percent of workers in Latin America are in, in the formal sector. In the formal sector <coughs> that that is almost one out of two Latin Americans who work. And uh, in the formal sector, people don't have access to credit, don't have access to the legal system, they cannot engage in contracts, they, cannot, they don't have access to insurance, their productivity is very low. Uh, they live basically on an economic apartheid. They live outside the legal system. So their chances of properly prospering in the formal sector are extremely limited. So it doesn't matter how fast our economies are growing in Latin America if you have one out of two Latin Americans working in the informal sector. The question is why we have so many people starting the informal sector. So let's go back to 19, the 1980s, mid-1980s, when a uh, Peruvian economist, Hernando de Soto, published a book uh, called The Other Path, El Otro Sendero. Hernando de Soto and some of his colleagues I went off to try an experiment, and it was they wanted to open a, a small manufacturing company, you know, a uh, textile manufacturing company, going through all the bureaucratic procedures in the law. You know, they wanted to comply with every single bureaucratic procedure and, and follow the law to see how long it would take them to open a business legally in Peru. And what they found was staggering. It took them like six months. To, open, to go through all these program procedures. In several instances, they had to buy, pay a bribe because the process wouldn't move along. So he documents all this in, in this book, The Other Path, and then he says that, look, the, fact, the reason why we have so many people in the formal sector in Latin America is because the cost of formality is so high. Only the rich people can afford, you know, waiting six months to open a business. The poor don't have that option, and they have to go through the formal, through the formal sector. 
In 2003, the World Bank, following on the steps of Rico Bernardo de Soto, published a report doing, uh, all doing business where they ran countries precisely, and they measured how long it takes to open a business legally in every country, like in 185 countries now. This is the Latin American average. 36 states on average it takes. It's been going down, but we're still the second region in the world that put the most hurdles and the most uh, uh, blocks the more entrepreneurship around the world. Look at the mostly developed countries of the OECD. It's the lowest. So Johan Norbert, the colleague of ours at the Cato Institute, he once wrote that if you live in a developed country and you want to become rich, you start a business. In Latin America, you need to be rich to start a business. Because only the rich people can afford the lawyers, only the rich people can afford the accountants, and only the rich people can go afford the cost of formality. Whereas the poor, they have to go to the formal sector. Another point is how long it takes registering a property and how many processes you have to go through to register a property. You notice that when you go to a favela, uh, sometimes you see like a, a house in shambles, you know, like a very poor house. But inside the house, you see a flat, flat uh, screen TV. Or you see like a Nice equipment, sound equipment, you know, or something like that. You're like, what the heck, you know, like, why don't they spend money on the house and not the, the you know, flat uh, TVs, uh, screens, or, or something? And uh, one of the reasons is that they don't have a title to that property. They don't have a title to that house, a property title. So they spend the money things they can take away eventually, in case they have, that they are evicted from that house. And why people don't have property titles? over the land and the houses that they live in. Because registering a property is the most complicated in Latin America. Now, this is also the topic of Bernardo de Soto's second book, The History of Capital. And he tried to measure how much wealth is hidden from the formal economy because of the property that is not really very, uh, uh, legally registered. Just do you know how much it takes in Brazil? On average? 107 days on average. So twice, more than twice, way more than twice the Latin American average, which what is already one of the one of the highest in the world. You know how much you think how many states to register a property legal in Brazil? 14. Twice as much as the Latin American average, which is already the world highest. The total tax burden, uh, I need to correct this. This is, this is not correct. This is uh, not a percent, percentage of profits, not the so a percentage of profits. If you look at the amount that an average businessman pays in taxes as a percentage of profits, we see that in Latin America, where the ones that tax businesses, the heaviest, just, just uh, South Southern Africa taxes more than this. You know how much is in Brazil? 68%. So uh, again, you know the cost of having a formal business in Latin America is extremely high. You are basically here look at the OECD, it's even lower. So people claim that you know in, in Europe and all that they tax the hell out of you, and they certainly do at the at an individual level, but businesses in particular are more heavily taxed in Latin America than in rich countries. So here we have in Latin America, we have that, that we pay European taxes for African services. Because that's, that's basically the case. Let's look at some examples of free market and liberal reform around the world. Just to finish. Estonia. Estonia in 1992 became independent. 1991, I think. It was 91 or 92. 1991 became independent of the Soviet Union. The country was a mess. The economy was a mess. They had a very young leadership. Marnar was prime minister. I think he was 32 when he was a prime minister. Uh, he was an historian. He's an historian. He wasn't even an economist. And he read Milton Friedman when he was in, in college. And he liked it. And he was like, well, this makes sense. So one of the first things they did in Estonia was abolish all tariffs. Absolute unilateral trade liberalization. 
They didn't say envoys to Washington and to Brussels telling them, okay, we're going to lower our targets if you lower yours. You know, like, we're going to end, you know, uh, our 5% targets on, on, you know, like uh, kitchens, you know, if, if, you, if you do the same. No, they just went ahead, a wallet of targets, and the country became a penny hub in the Baltics. It's one of the most modern economies in the region. Unfortunately, they have to raise some tariffs back when they came back into the European Union, you know, because the European Union is a common market and they have to raise tariffs again. But it was a very successful experiment while it lasted. And, uh, and, and uh, Estonia is, I guess, is the most modern uh, economy outside the old Soviet bloc. New Zealand, in 1984, it abolished all agricultural subsidies, a labor program. Uh, and you know what they I mean, uh, farmers went into the streets, they said they were going to be wiped out by competition if they didn't receive any good support from government and all. But still, what happened? Agricultural productivity has increased 6% per year since 1984. It's one of the most productive and efficient uh, agricultural sectors in the world. And actually, when you see that, that like uh, there are negotiations for two trade agreements between New Zealand and other countries. All the other countries are always afraid to compete with New Zealand when it comes to their agricultural sector. New Zealand, a small country where there are more chips than, than human beings. Again, the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, started by Estonia, introduced a flat tax in the 1990s. We've seen this, and this is a, a very important topic here in Brazil because according to the world, economic form, you have the worst tax system in the world. It takes on average uh, like 2,300 hours on average for a businessman to calculate his taxes here in Brazil. So in the 1990s, you know, when the Baltic countries said, well, we're not going to have a complicated tax system, you know, because you have all this uh, rhetoric about the, tip, the rich pay more than the, pay more taxes than the poor, but then you create uh, exceptions to the, in the tax system, and then the tax credits, and then you have an extremely complicated tax code, you know, literally thousands of pages. And uh, you have, I think in the United States, you have seven, 70 definitions for a small business in the tax code, in the US tax code. So the Baltic country said, like, forget about it. We're just going to tax everything the same, at the same level. It depends on, it can be a, the flat tax doesn't necessarily mean a low for example, in, the, in, that, in Lithuania, the last time I checked, it was 33%. I don't know if that's been lower. But in some countries, the flag tax is as low as 10% or 9%. And that has been a tremendous boost to the economy. Yet, you don't spend literally tens of hours, and dozens of hours, hundreds of hours calculating your taxes. You can fill your taxes like in a company in just one hour, in one afternoon, and then spend the rest of the time producing well. And the Baltic countries are, have, uh, enjoy the, royals, the highest growth rates uh, among the old Soviet bloc. It's, it's been a tremendous success that has spread around Eastern Europe, and hopefully one day we'll get it into the Americas. Sweden, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, nirvana of, of social democrats. Uh, in 1992, we used to use a school voucher system where it gives parents a certain amount of money so they can go with that money and, and enroll their children into a private school. For profit private school, they are for profit private schools. And uh, the amount of students in Sweden's free schools, as they are called, has been increasing ever since. And now for high school it's 25%, 25% of, of uh, Street teenagers go to free schools, to private schools. And the quality of those schools is significantly superior to the ones in public schools. I was surprised because I was reading a paper recently and I just found out that apparently uh, Sweden had a very bad education system compared to other countries in the region, in, the, in, the, in Scandinavia and so on. But since the introduction of the, of, the, uh, of the free schools and the voucher system, the quality of education has improved. They are still not among the top 10 according to visa results, but it's been, it's been, uh, it's been improved. 
New Zealand, the best country to start a business, according to the World Bank. It takes half a day to open a business. Just one bureaucratic procedure. I don't know the, I don't know the, the, the amount of New Zealanders that work in the informal sector. It will be an interesting uh, figure to find out. But I don't think it's as high as that in America. If you can open a business legally in an afternoon. Uh, registering a property, it takes just one day and two bureaucratic steps. So this is the most friendly place for businesses around the world, right here in New Zealand. So this is a this is a, 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 a reform that can be implemented, and I don't think that there will be we will face a lot of, uh, of anger, socially social uh, you know like resistance to implement our reform. We're going to go to the streets and demand that we take 107 days to open a business, you know. I can even see a left wing government doing this. It's, it's common sense. Let's look at some liberal reforms in Latin America. Panama. Panama became independent in 1903 from, from Colombia. And he decided that for a country such as Panama, the best monetary policy is not having a currency of its own. So he adopted the dollar as its official currency since 1903. And Panama has had dictators, Noruega. It has had like Nacor dictatorship, like Noruega. The, uh, it has been invaded by the U.S. I mean, it has many, it has had many fights throughout its history. But they never had one bad thing, high inflation. The average inflation rate of Panama has been lower even to that of the United States. And El Salvador and, and Ecuador follow the example. They dollarized the economies also in the, 19, in the early 2000s. Ecuador, here you have a left-wing government, a populist government, a populist president, with an inflation rate of 2%, instead of 65% or something, which is uh, the latest figure I saw for Venezuela. Chile, it privatized the pension system in 1981. That's uh, Jose Piñera, the labor minister of, uh, of uh, Chile in those, in those days. Uh, he's a, a, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. And Chile uh, realized something back then that now is haunting most major economies around the world, and is that the pension system in these countries, the public pension system, is unsustainable. You know, it works as long as you have more workers entering the labor force every year paying for the pension of those people who have retired. So they work as long as the demographics look like this, you know. Uh, in the old days, you will have 10 workers, let's say, paying for the pension of the, of the person who must retire. But as populations grow older, that the trend is becoming more and more like this, like this. And you have less workers paying for the pension of the retirees. In Costa Rica, we have, I think it's like three workers paying for the pension of every retiree. And you know, and that is aggravated by the fact that people are living longer. You know, when the original social security systems were created, the retirement age was higher than the life expectancy. Uh, those companies. So the, the system was created to be a scam for the first time, for the first moment. But now, since people are growing older and older, uh, even longer lives, you know, like the average retirement age is like 65. Well, here in Brazil, I heard that you have examples of people retiring at 50 in certain professions. So if you keep up with 80, which is like the average expectancy life of the rate, right? I don't know how long it is for Brazil, I guess it's 70 something, 77 or something like that. Well, you know, people who spend like a quarter of their lives, less, more than a quarter of their lives, you know, like receiving a pension. So the, the system is highly unsustainable. So in Chile, what they did in 1981 was that instead of having that kind of system, public system, where you have basically like generational distribution of wealth, you will have an individual private account. You will still contribute to a pension, but that money will go to an individual pension account under your name. And you will see every month how that pension account grows. And that pension, that money, is invested in the market, following certain rules. The average real return rate 
of those pension funds since 1981 has been 8.8% .8 a year. Extremely high. Just find an investment that will give you that rate of return over 30 years, every year. By, that, by 2014, the pension funds reach over $171 billion, which is over 50% of the Chilean economy. They have, it's a country with huge savings, and that uh, strengthens also the macroeconomic stability of that country. Guatemala. Guatemala is a country that is extremely dysfunctional in many, in many senses. It's one of the poorest countries in, in, in the Americas. But in 1996, they did something amazing. They totally privatized the telecommunications uh, uh, system industry. They privatized the, uh, the state-owned operators. They allowed total free competition in the telecom. You know, you don't have uh, any barrier to the entry of your companies, like mostly happens in our countries where the government says only free operators can, you know, like compete. They're not totally open in that regard. Even the electoral. The, 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 uh, I forgot the word. The what? The power. No, the power is not the electromagnetic. Uh, no, the spectrum. spectrum. The spectrum uh, was privatized. Uh, what happened? A lot of competition. It's a country with a lot of operators in, in different in, in telecom, in, in cellular, uh, cellular uh, phones, in, in landlines, in internet providers. It lowered the prices. It has one of the highest penetration rates for cell phone uh, usage in Latin America, despite being one of the poorest countries. And it has the best quality to cost value in the Americas, an extremely successful example in a very troubled country. And let's talk about individual liberties, also liberal reforms. Worldwide, the first country to fully legalize marijuana last year. Uh, it's a growing trend now. Over 50% of Americans support legalizing marijuana. You have two states in the U.S. that have legalized marijuana too, Washington and Colorado. And the worldwide legislation includes the production, distribution, and sale of the drug. So there is a country that, you know, like finally its leadership realized that the world drug is a failure, and it's taking concrete steps, we're just talking, concrete steps to uh, legalize the trade of at least one drug, which is, uh, which is uh, marijuana. Argentina, it's difficult to find an example of something good going on in Argentina right now. <laughs> but actually, in 2010, they implemented a very liberal reform, which is that they became the first married, uh, Latin American country to approve married, marriage equality. And uh, it's a very uh, progressive legislation because it guarantees equal marriage globally, regardless of nationality or residence. Uruguay follows suit, and hopefully, uh, I think Mexico City also legalized gay marriage in, in, in recent, recent times. Hopefully, more countries will continue this path in Latin America uh, soon. And I want to finish with my own country, Costa Rica. We abolished the army in 1948. We realized that there was no point in having an army. The only country with a long history of invading others in our region is the United States, and there's no point in having an army if the US is going to invade us. And actually, we're the only country in the uh, Caribbean basin, I think, that hasn't been invaded by the US which probably has to do with the fact that we don't have an army. We look pretty bad. <laughs> uh, no single international conflict in 60 years. We're one of the most stable democracies in Latin America. No army is going to topple us. But I'm not in the same 1990s. And the question is, and I, 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 this has proved very controversial, controversial what I did this talk in Brazil, but we don't have an army in Latin America. You know, there hasn't been a major uh, international conflict since the Falklands War in 1981, which was an utter failure for Argentina. And in the regional war, I think in the Pacific War, in uh, the Chaco War in 1930 between Bolivia and Paraguay, and the Pacific War between Chile, Peru, and Bolivia in the 1870s. Besides that, it's an extremely peaceful region in the world. And yet, we're the, region, the same region that spends the most on the militaries. What's the point? What's the point of Brazil in building an aircraft carrier that they are now using? It's going to cost billions of dollars. So I would say that forget about it. We should follow the example of my forebears, abolish the armies, and have a very peaceful region for everyone here in Latin America. So with that, I'm going to finish and give it to you. So